why? We're like, why? Wow. So while we're alive, you can go ahead. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining my first town hall. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by many of my constituents and supporters. Um, I was sworn in on December 7th, so just over a month ago, uh, but we've been a definitely a very busy start. So I'm very excited to update you all on everything that's going on. I'm gonna allow a couple, maybe a minute or so for people to trickle in still. I can see the numbers of participants going up, but uh, I'm just gonna have a couple housekeeping rules as reminders for folks is that I highly encourage you to, answer, to ask questions. We have a Q and A function enabled in the Zoom chat if you are in the Zoom. Um, in which you case you can ask, ask questions that way. And we will be answering questions later on in the night. You can also uh, submit questions via our Facebook page, Assembly Member Alex Lee page, and we will be also uh, pulling questions from the Facebook as well. Um, but I will say that, you know, if you are having a personal issue you would like our office's help in, feel free to contact our office at the contact info that will be present on the slides um, pretty frequently. Uh, because if there are any issues, I, I would rather uh, we, I not have to read uh, anyone's personal information out loud for the internet and we can just uh, work on it individually. Um, are we still having the slides on? Or uh, Well, while we're having that, yes, there we go. There's our slides going on. Um, so yes, so that is our contact information. If you have any questions or any personal issues that are coming up, feel free to call us. You can call our phone number there on the screen, either the 408 number or the 916 number. Uh, or email us at assemblymember.li at assembly.ca.gov or go to our website. All of those work. Um, and as people are still trickling in, I do also wanna recognize some esteemed colleagues of mine and elected local officials I wanna recognize who are in attendance with us virtually. Uh, of course, I really wish we could the safest way to do it. So here are my honorable mentions of folks who are joining our call who are local leaders. Uh, we have Milpitas Council Member Carmen Montano, we have Milpitas Unified School District Trustee Min No. We have Milpitas School District Trustee and President Chris Norwood. We have Santa Clara City Council Member Suds Jane. We have San Jose City Council Member Pam Foley joining us. We have Berryessa Unified School District Board Member Jai Srinivasan joining us. Um, we have Santa Clara Unified School Unified School Board Trustee Albert Gonzalez. We have Milpitas Council Member Karina Dominguez. We have Supervisor Otto Lee. We have Santa, Cla Santa Clara Su County Supervisor Otto Lee. We have Santa Clara Unified School, School District Board Member Bonnie Lieberman. We have Santa Clara County Board of Education Trustee Peter Ortiz. And we have New York, Newark Unified Trust School Board Trustee Terrence Grindle. We have Fremont City Council member Teresa Cox, and I'm hoping I'm not missing anyone. Um, we also have representatives from Congress member Ro Khanna. And last but not least, we have Milpitas Mayor Rich Tran also in attendance with us. So thank you so much everyone for attending. And we're gonna go about to get started. But again, a couple of housekeeping tips is that uh, if you have any personal issues uh, you want our office to help you with, feel free to please contact the phone number or email that is on the screen with you now. Um, but I welcome any questions. You can submit questions via the Q&A function on the chat. And I already see some questions pouring in, which is awesome. Um, or you can comment on Facebook. Um, we will try to be get, we will definitely have a lot more uh, questions than we'll get through tonight. So we will have a follow up for folks if you leave your contact information for us, uh, whichever method uh, you prefer on the chat. Um, I'm missing anything. Oh yes, another thing is that, um, no, I think that's it. I'll, I'll have more housekeeping things as they come for sure. All right, if we go to the next slide, we'll get started then. Um, so quick overview about tonight's town hall is I'm going to give an overview about what we're working on Sacramento, the COVID situation and how the state is adapting to everything. And then we will have a good chunk of time dedicated to answering questions from you. So feel free to submit questions anytime. All righty, so, so about me. Uh, I was elected in November 2020, which feels like an ages, 
and ages and ages ago at this point, but I represent, the, I'm honored to represent the 25th Assembly District. This is the area that I've grown up and called home my entire life. I grew up in Milpitas and Northern San Jose. I'm a graduate of Milpitas Unified School District, and also I graduated from UC Davis. I also have the distinction of being one of the youngest assembly members, well, youngest state legislators in California history, as well as the first bisexual state legislator uh, at the age of 25, which is also the same number as our district. Uh, the, um, I previously worked for Senator, State Senator Henry Stern and for Assembly Member Evan Lowe, who is an Assembly Member in the adjacent district. Um, my priorities are listed there, like public safety, housing, education, and climate change. And I'm really hoping to use my experience as a legislative policy advisor to make effectuate a lot of change. Um, I got the chance to meet a lot of folks during the campaign season last time, and um, now I'm very proud to be able to represent you here in Sacramento. I actually am calling or uh, coming live to you from Sacramento. This is my office in Sacramento. The palm tree in the back is the Capitol Park. Um, I would give a Capitol office tour for you all, but unfortunately, because of COVID, we have had no time to decorate. There's not a lot to see except for these wooden walls in here. So anyways, let's go on. Um, yes, next slide. So Assembly District 25 is comprised of two counties, Alameda County and Santa Clara County. I have the city of I represent the city of Fremont, the city of Newark, as well as this, as well as the cities of Milpitas, Santa Clara, and Northern San Jose. So if you live within these jurisdictions, I'm proud to be your assembly member and represent you. So if you have any issues, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. If you have any issues at all, including any of these issues, feel free to contact our office. I will say that the most prevalent caseload that we're working with, and it is very valid if you have concerns or questions about it is EDD. If you are someone who needs unemployment assistance, and that's through the department known as EDD or disability insurance, please do feel free to call our office. Um, we, it is, I will say it is not uncommon right now for many folks to be struggling with the system. Um, and not to mince words, but to be honest with you all, is EDD's frankly mismanagement and their antiquated technology has led to a lot of problems for Californians who are deserving of that uh, the relief they need right now, especially during the pandemic and the recession where a lot of folks have lost a lot of their op economic opportunities. So please, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office if you're experiencing problems with the user face or you're not just able to get through the system or something is going wrong, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We also do things related to the DMV about driver's license or any issues what you might have with DMV. Um, the DMV right now has very limited in-person appointments and that's causing a lot of delays, understandably. So we can also help you if that's necessary. Um, but any of these issues on the list you see here, we are ready to help you with. And feel free to call any of those numbers on there during business hours or send us an email, either works. Uh, could we go to the next slide, please? We also provide you updates with uh, what's happening in the state capital, what's happening in the state government. Um, so I, and I'll go over this about my committee assignments, but in addition to going over what I'm working on, I always, I in my office, I'm happy to relay information about what's going on in the state government process. If you genuinely have questions about what is the state doing to appropriate money for COVID relief? How, how, are, we, how are we going to be protecting small landlords and renters? Those are very valid questions that I always welcome your opinions on. And I can see from the mounting Q and A questions that some, a lot of folks are asking questions like that. But if you, you know, have these questions, feel free to please submit them to our office. You can always call, you can, um, you can email, any of that works. Uh, and then hopefully after the pandemic is, is done, we can give state capital tours too. Fun fact is because I was a state, uh, I was a state capital staffer, I used to give those capital tours. So maybe one day I'll actually give some constituent tours too. I have a lot of fun spots I like to show people in the capital. All right, can we go to the next slide please? Uh, yes, so you can also uh, express opinions to us, which is really awesome, or if you had bill ideas, that is really what's important. I've heard so many great ideas from the community or just concerns you have, and then we can translate that into fundamental policy that will be important to people uh, and propose that at the state capitol. Uh, especially if you have bill ideas or if you're having troubles with agencies or you want to report misconduct, right, whether it be a DMV or EDD misconduct or something like that, feel free to do that. Okay, uh, if you could please go to the next slide. Okay, now we're going to talk today about COVID-19 and the pandemic, which is, I will say from our phone calls, our messages, is the number one priority that's on everyone's mind, rightly so. So I just want to start off by saying 
these are the county testing or these are the COVID testing sites. It is free, it is easy, and you can make an appointment in advance and you don't have to wait in line. So we're gonna just quickly go over this is in the, if you live in the city of Fremont, these are the two sites that are available for you to get a testing. It's either at the Bay Area Community Health Liberty Clinic on Liberty Street or the Asian Health Services on Alder Avenue. Those are two sites if you live in Fremont. Uh, could you go to the next one? If you live in the city of Newark, you can go to the Core and Newark Wellness Center, which is on Civic Terrace Avenue, or you can go to the Bay Area Community Health Center uh, on New Park, at New Park Mall. In the next one. And then in Santa Clara County, if you live in Milpitas, you'll go to the Milpitas Library in the parking structure, or you go to the Milpitas Sports Center on Calaveras Boulevard. Um, go to the next one. And in the city of Santa Clara, you can go to the Central Park Library, which is on Homestead Road. And if you know, and if you still are finding alternative spots, or you need to find more testing sites, you can got, visit the respective county websites for COVID testing information. And then last but not least, we have uh, testing sites in San Jose. There's three sites. There's uh, Emanuel Baptist Church on North White Road. There is Project Baseline at Independence High School. And then there is Valley Health Center East Valley. And these are not the only sites in San Jose, but these are the ones closest to our residents in uh, Assembly District 25. Um, these are very close to uh, residents who live in North and East Side San Jose. So you can go there. All righty. So now we're gonna talk a bit more about the pandemic and the vaccine situation, which I have seen a lot of questions about. So uh, before we go into dive into those questions, I am gonna give a brief overview about what the vaccine situation is like. If we go to the next slide, please. All right, so very, very important is that if you are eligible to get a vaccine and you can get it, it is no cost upfront to you. I'll just make that clear. It is free, it is no cost to you, and it does not require insurance. Even if you don't have insurance, you can get the vaccine. Um, they will ask for your insurance, but that does not bar you from getting it. Um, about So right now we're in phase 1A, and that is about 3 million people in the state of California. And that includes healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, uh, emergency services like paramedics, fire, EMT, and long-term care residents. Um, you might have heard on the news that uh, the state is stepping up to open to the next phase of getting folks who are 65 and older. Uh, but that does not remain, does, that is not the case currently in Santa Clara or Alameda County. And that is only because there are not enough available doses to expand it to seniors who are 65 plus, unfortunately. We are still getting through the phase of getting to these phase 1A uh, category persons, uh, long-term care residents and healthcare workers. Uh, we still don't have enough doses to meet that need, and that is something I am watching very closely and making sure that will happen for our residents, uh, because vaccine deployment is um, is going to, is going through the state department was go is managed through the state administration. However, we have expanded to seventy five plus year old seniors. Um, so you, if you if you or a loved one or your family member is a seventy five plus year old senior in either of our counties, they will be eligible for a vaccine. And again, that is no cost to you. It does not require insurance. And I would highly encourage you to sign up for it and get an appointment to get a vaccine. All right, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, and just a quick overview. Um, currently, the state of California rolls out vaccines in tiers. And the tiers are based on categories of folks based on their work or based on their age. So in tier one, 1B um, currently, it is folks who work in education, childcare, emergency services, and food and agriculture. Food and agriculture will include folks who work in grocery stores or um, in, that, in that line of work. Uh, just to clarify again, individuals who are 75 plus, uh, 75 plus are now included in the current, current phase that we're in. We're still in phase 1A. We haven't advanced to 1B yet, just to be clear. And that is largely due to uh, difficulties obtaining enough doses for everyone. We are a very, very big state. I'm sure you've seen many, many, um, many stats about how California is behind in deployment, which is also true. But our raw amount of doses, the, the, the true quantity of doses is still not enough in manufacturing. Um, and then phase 1B, as you see on there, is folks who are 65 to 74 age range. 
also work in a, uh, many other um, job settings as well. If we go to the next slide, please. Phase 1C is individuals 50 to 64 years old and people of 16 and 49 years old who have underlying health conditions or disabilities. That is important. So it's not just everyone who is between the ages of 16 and 49. Um, there will be a lot of other folks who are a part of this um, phase 1C. Uh, I myself personally am not expecting to get the vaccine anytime soon until maybe spring or later. And I think that's rightfully and justfully so that we should be prioritizing healthcare workers and our seniors. And frankly, I think that that is a good choice to be having. So that's what 1C looks like. Uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, sorry. Let, for before I go into committee and caucuses, I just want to give a brief overview about the pandemic and COVID situation in general. Now that is, and I will talk about narrow legislation as well. COVID-19 is the priority of the state legislature, of the state assembly right now. Everything we're doing has such a strong, urgent lens about the pandemic, and that includes so many things. And one thing that I have heard a lot about, and I want to address uh, before I go into committees, is about school reopenings or reopenings in general. So I'm of the mindset that I would love for us to be going back to normal, having our kids go back to school, learning as appropriately as possible, uh, as soon as possible. That would be fantastic. But I am always concerned that we are pushing our opening deadlines or our opening target dates based on what we want rather than what the data tells us. And I will show, share these couple of data points with you. The, under the current, under Gavin Newsom, the governor's uh, plan to reopen schools, which he has, uh, which I think is a little arbitrary target dates of March and February. Remember, we are almost done with January already, hard to say, hard to believe, is that among several, uh, several prerequisites is to not have a county to have no more than 28 per 100,000 cases, 28. Now the CDC, now the CDC ranks 20 to 50 cases per, one, per 100,000 to be moderate risk of transmission at schools. So if we do open, that is accepting the CDC's moderate risk uh, assessment they indicate that the lowest risk of transmission, the CDC, the Federal Center for Disease Control, is less than five per 100,000. And to share with you how we're doing in Alameda County and Santa Clara, respectively, is that currently in Alameda County, we are at 35.5 per 100,000, which is still far off from the 28. And in Santa Clara, we are at 47.9 per 100,000 cases, per 100,000 persons, I should say. The ICU capacity in um, the ICU capacity regionally in Alameda County is currently, or regionally in the Bay Area is three percent. Alameda County right now is thirty percent ICU capacity. Santa Clara County is two percent. So that means that's the amount of available beds in the ICUs we have in our hospitals before we roll into emergency ICU capacity. And I will say that is the case of what Southern California is in right now. They've had zero capacity ICU for perhaps a month now. We definitely do not want to get to that dire straits where it would be very, very dangerous for folks to resume any sense of normalcy. You have probably heard about the purple tiers or the colored tiers as well. We are currently in a very, very deep state of purple because purple before was indicated as more than seven per 100,000 cases, more than seven. Remember, respectively, in Alameda County, we are at 35.5, and in Santa Clara, we have 47.9. So as, as troubling as that is, there is the light, light at the end of the tunnel. The vaccine program will roll out. We will be able to defeat the virus, but that does not mean we drop our guard. Vaccine is not a silver bullet. It does not make you um, automatically immune or automatically um, give you license to be reckless. So it is very, very, very important that we are still responsible for our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, our essential workers, and our seniors. Very, very essential we still do that. Um, and that is, the, that is the lens I'm taking when we are uh, debating measures about every measure that is related to COVID at this point. So I'm gonna go over now our, my committee assignments and our caucus, and we're gonna start talk, shifting over to a policy viewpoint. And I do see more and more questions coming in, so keep them coming in if you have questions. Um, I sit on these following committees. I sit on the Transportation Committee. I sit on the Privacy and Consumer Affairs Committee, the Rules Committee, 
and the Committee on Education and the Budget Committee, especially as a subcommittee relating to education financing. Uh, now quickly, I, I, I feel like they're pretty self-explanatory, but the reason I'm on these committees is one, to make sure there are ample modes of transportation available for folks and to also reduce climate change uh, by reducing uh, polluting car trips. Privacy is very big, especially our district, which is part of the Silicon Valley. We must be holding our, our big, big corporations accountable and responsible, especially as you're seeing all this news about you know, radicalization through the internet and all that, so, so important. Rules is basically the rules of the assembly and we, it's, it's a bit more uh, boring, I guess, in that way. It's the rules of how we con conduct ourselves in the assembly. And on education, pretty self-explanatory is that I make, we're making policy about how education is done in the state of California and how it's financed, frankly. I am also a member of the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, owing to my ethnicity. I am also a member of the Bay Area Caucus and I'm also a member of the LGBTQ Caucus, so I'm very proud to do that. I'm also part of the Environmental Caucus now and also the Progressive Caucus as well. All right, let's go to the next one. So here are the bills that we're introducing and that we're co-authoring. So I'll just start with what we're co-authoring first, how about that? So earlier this, well, actually last week, um, I authored, I co-authored a letter with many of my co legislative colleagues requesting that $5 billion be included as an investment in the state budget to ailing working families who are going to be struggling to make, make back rent. In that regard also, I am a co-author for AB 15 with Assembly Member Chu, uh, David Chu, which is extending the eviction moratorium. Now the eviction moratorium essentially says you cannot be kicked out simply because you don't have money anymore given that's a pandemic and a lot of people have lost their jobs and still continue to lose their jobs. Um, that eviction moratorium, unfortunately, will expire January 31st, the end of this month, unless we take urgent action, which we are working very diligently right now to extend that eviction moratorium. Very important caveat for landlords is that um, it stipulates that even during the eviction moratorium, 25% of rent is still owed in this period, and the rest of it, the remaining 75% of it, it will be owed at, in form of debt. Now it's very important that we extend it common sense with common sense because if we extend it too short then we run the risk of having to have these conversations every month and put more and more families at risk and uncertainty. It's really important to get the relief to them and the small landlords to make sure they can weather this this pandemic together because ultimately if there isn't an economic recovery or direct aid to renters and working families and the small landlords there's going to be a, a big eviction crisis and worsen our homelessness crisis. So that is something deeply of concern to me. Now, I also co-opted these other uh, bills. AB 74 is cracking down uh, or modernizing EDD to make it more um, streamlined and have more direct deposit options. Uh, right now, there's a lot of basically uh, antiquated snafus that can happen. And this is a bill to modernize it. I'm also a co-author with uh, San Jose Assembly Member Oshkara to do the Racial Justice Act which basically is going to root out racism in our judicial, uh, in our courts and courtrooms essentially, and our conviction, uh, conviction let's say. Uh, another bill I'm also co-authoring is to ban the use of tear gas and rubber bullets on protesters. As we've seen this summer, the police, um, unfortunately were very, very uh, eager to deploy these methods on, on a lot of peaceful protesters. And you know, a lot too is to be said about what's happened in DC and there's not to be the same, um, use of force in these ways. Uh, another bill I'm co-authoring with the chair of public safety uh, is AB, 4, AD, AB 89, which will increase the uh, minimum prerequisite to be a police officer to be either to be 25 years old, which is my age, or to have a Bachelor of Arts or other um, similar requirements. And that is to make sure that our police officers, uh, we have higher standards to make sure they are more and more uh, ready to have the responsibility of the job. Now, the exciting part, I'm going to talk about the bills that we are introducing. So uh, the bill that I have introduced up to this point is Assembly Bill 20. That bill I introduced on the first day in office on December 7th, and that bill is the Clean Money Act. It does two things and is a very pivotal moment in a very pivotal moment for history. It does two things. It will, one, build a publicly financed election system so that everyday Californians like you and me, or you and me, will be able to um, contribute to the candidates we like, not just giant corporations or super wealthy people who can donate thousands and thousands of dollars. 
The second thing it does is it bans corporations from donating to candidates. So whether you're a local city council member or you're running for governor or you're running for the assembly, you will not be able to be influenced by the giant mega corporations that exist even in our community. Because fundamentally, I think it does a disservice to a democracy if the decisions we're making are questioned because of the dollars that come from big, big corporations that honestly, when they drop a couple thousand dollars, is a drop in the bucket for them. We're talking about obviously when we live in Silicon Valley, there are companies that have worldwide presence and have and operate in the billions, if not more. So that's why it's very important to have this measure. I welcome your support in this measure because it's very, very important to rebalance your democracy and make sure it works for us, the people, and not for corporate special interests. Um, if you know anything from about my campaign is that, and I've committed to this for the, the rest of my career, is that I don't take any money from corporations at all. So this would level the playing field for everyone and make sure that we are all accountable to the, accountable to our communities. And that's why I believe in it so strongly and I've opted out of this money, even though it is, I would say, politically uncommon to do so in our system that is so run by money and campaign contributions, I have decided not to take any of this money uh, voluntarily, even though it makes my life more difficult politically. All right, and other things we're doing. We are going to be introducing a, uh, a tax on the rich and, it, and that is going to be fleshed out more. But as you probably all know, during a time of unprecedented economic turmoil where millions of Californians have lost their jobs and livelihoods, corporations like Amazon, especially, are making, how's the phrase goes, hand over fist, making dollars hand over fist. They're making so much more. And even Elon Musk has surpassed um, Jeff Bezos as the richest person in the world. So even during this, this time of devastating economic uncertainty, the rich keep getting richer. So we are going to re we are going to rebalance that and make sure that those who have benefited disproportionately are paying their fair, their fair share in California to lift up those in need and to, and to make sure that the, that's being reinvested in our community. Another thing we're gonna do is what's called a vacancy tax. A vacancy tax essentially is an incentive to make sure that all our housing is being used appropriately so that people are not keeping housing purposely vacant. Um, something that I did notice in, and I'm sure you've noticed in our communities often is that someone will come buy a home, new or old, and it will be sit empty for a long time. Because that, because unfortunately, a lot of folks see houses not as homes, but as investment vehicles. And these could be investors from all over the place, whether they be outside of California, in California, or other countries even. And that does a real disservice to families who are struggling to make, make, it, make men's meet right now. Because housing, as we all know, this is very, very unaffordable in the Bay Area, especially in our community. And it does a huge service that we let perfectly good homes sit vacant just so they can accrue interest or accrue value. Um, so that's, so we are gonna model our vacancy tax bill after very common sense policy in Canada and make sure that homes, perfectly good homes are actually getting to folks who need it, whether they're being purchased or being rented out. It basically, our bill would essentially say, you should rent out you should rent out or sell your home or have someone live in it essentially uh, for, you should have someone, you should not keep it vacant for more than six months essentially. So to keep people housed. Uh, other things we're working on is also eliminating tax breaks on wealthy people and their vacation homes. So a lot of people have taken advantage of tax loopholes that still exists unfortunately in uh, California tax code to buy vacation homes. And this goes hand in hand with the idea that, you know, a lot of folks are struggling to even have a home or have a roof over their head. And yet people are uh, essentially, and essentially the state of California is subsidizing wealthy people to have vacation homes. And that's not right. You know, if you want to buy a vacation home, that's fine. You can do that on your own, but we're not going to give you more tax breaks. And also on the topic of housing, I am talking about housing a lot because that is something of uh, very great interest to our constituent, to our community, our constituency, and of personally myself as well. Uh, social housing is a big thing. So you might be asking, what is social housing? Social housing, uh, surprisingly, a lot of folks actually have um, experience with before. So whether you've lived in a dorm or you're advocating for teacher housing or workforce housing, that is social housing. That social housing is the public alternative to making sure we are building housing as a social good and hopefully at cost as much as possible. Right now, the paradigm is that local municipalities only have private essentially only have private for-profit developers who call the shots with the housing. So if you've ever felt 
disillusioned by the housing process or dis disaffected in some ways, this is a strong core to remedy that is we should be building housing. And I've talked to so many people about this. We should talk, we should be building housing as a social good. So it's not a foreign concept. It's not a radical idea, not even in this country, but we can make some real investments in making sure that people are housed uh, for the public good. We're also gonna do a bill about increasing government transparency. Um, in the era of COVID and Zoom, like we're doing today, I am going to, um, we are going to introduce a, uh, a bill that allows folks to continue participating remotely, whether it be by phone, whether it be by Zoom or some other digital means and with language access to their government hearings. So whether that be a legislative hearing up here in Sacramento or their city councils, it's so important to preserve that access because I think, and I've seen it too, is that it really increases participation of people who generally are disenfranchised from that, right? How many folks here could probably afford to come on a Tuesday evening up to Sacramento to testify on something they actually care about? It's very, very difficult, right? So we need to make sure that preservation and that participation is, is there. As much as you know, it might make some of our politicians' lives easier to not have public comment, or like I don't have to sit through as many hours of hearing of, of public comment, I think it is so vital to be able to hear your public comment and without you having to rather expose yourself to any health risks of traveling to Sacramento um, or taking time off work or finding childcare, it's so important that you still have a voice in our process. Uh, we're also going to do a bill to protect mobile home park residents from unnecessary, unnecessary and ambiguous uh, water rate charges. There's precedence in that in protecting mobile home owners from uh, frivolous electricity bills. So we're doing the same thing with water. We're also going to be increasing our represent student representation on student aid commissions to make sure that students have a greater say in the student, um, in student aid decisions, frankly. Uh, at the college level. And we're also, very excitingly, going to be taking on uh, the big tech companies that are ride, oh, not sure, not ride, they're delivery apps. So this is a problem right now that our counties are actually dealing with currently, is that um, I'm sure many folks on the call have done this, but you've ordered food through an app. Now, while it may be very convenient and, um, well, it'll be very convenient and easy to do so, uh, they actually take a big chunk out of small of restaurants. And that really hurts small businesses when we need, when they need all the help they can. And that sometimes can be 30% or more in some jurisdictions. So we are going to propose a bill to level off that, that cap and make sure also that they cannot uh, just push the, uh, the fees onto, onto consumers. Um, one thing I'm always a big fan of, and I try to do this personally as much as possible, is if you can, especially for local small businesses, if you're going to order food, take out, uh, call. If you can, call, ask to place your order, skip the delivery app if you can. Some places do prefer delivery app for a lot of different reasons, and that's understandable. But if you can, call, keep our small businesses afloat. I think they really make our, our cities unique, you know, especially in uh, Assembly District 25. So definitely try to call if you can. I try to do that as much as possible. But those are the bills that we are going to be carrying, uh, at least initially. Uh, every assembly member actually has a maximum of 50 for every two years. I don't know if we're going to do all 50, but these are the first bills we are committing to do. And the bill introduction deadline is coming up. So these are the bills we're doing. If you have ideas or of the like, you can always present them to us. So I've uh, gone on enough, long enough about things we're working on in Sacramento. Uh, I would like to move into the questions and answers portion where you can answer, ask questions. So if you're watching, on Facebook or another um, social media site, please do answer your, or please do comment your questions on Facebook comment, where my staff will um, try to pull questions as much as possible. Uh, just as a reminder, you can also do it on Zoom via the Q&A function. Um, and as also another reminder is if you are experiencing a personal, a personal issue right now where you need our assistance, please feel free to call the number that was on the screen earlier. Um, call the number or email us because I will, um, you probably prefer me not reading out your personal details online to the entire world. Um, so with that, let us start with some of the questions. So let me see what kind of questions we have. Um, yes, here we go. So this one is from Allison. Uh, Allison writes, thank you for your support of assembly bills 15 and 16. Those are the bills to extend the eviction moratorium and to create a, uh, rent, a relief program for small landlords and renters. How likely are they to pass as is? 
Do you think the moratorium will be extended until the end of the year? So currently as written, Assembly Bill 15 is to extend till January of 2022. That is my hope. Though I think with negotiations with the governor's office, a lot of different stakeholders, um, they are gonna come to some compromise, which isn't my preference because I think we need as much time as possible to be working out, to be putting a pause on evictions and then working out solutions because there's no guarantee. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee the pandemic could even be over by January 2022. That's the reality, is that could be the reality. And I would rather err on the side of caution on that sense. Um, so I think it is a very, very likely to pass. Every legislator I've talked to knows that this is such an urgent issue. It's just a matter of what the details are and when the timing is. But I cannot fathom thinking of any legislator right now that thinks it is a good idea to have more people evicted and kicked out of the streets. So that's that one. All right, here's another question. Uh, Sorry, there's just a lot of questions coming very quickly, rapidly. Um, from Brian, what can be done to speed up COVID-19 vaccination distribution? Our local healthcare providers are moving very slowly and two thirds of the state's vaccines have gone unused. Future federal allocations will be reduced if we aren't using what we have. Very true, very good concern. Um, it's a complicated answer for sure. Um, we, and this is, this is partly the failings of our governments but this is also partly um, partly the part of if you are eligible to get vaccine, I highly encourage you to do so. So you'll probably have seen stories about people, especially in Southern California and even the Bay Area who have opted out, even though they are eligible. While that does make it available for other folks, it is highly, highly suggested that you get the vaccine while you're eligible. And as Brian has alluded to, um, the way these, the Trump administration kind of has a name funding, not funding formula, allocation formulas makes it very difficult if we are opting out because then they will assume the need is less. So if you are indeed a healthcare worker uh, and 75 plus year old, or you have a family member that's 75 plus years old, please do sign up to get it. It is an opt-in program. No one is forcing you to get the vaccine, but if you're eligible and willing to get the vaccine, I would really, really encourage you to do so and get vaccinated. So that's very important. Uh, here's a good question from F Ferdy. What can, what can we do to help the homeless? Very good question. Compassion and government action and or cash and action in general are the two key things we must do. We have to remember that the folks who don't have roofs over their head heads are still human beings. We don't know exactly how someone got to the point where they are today, but we have to remember that Sometimes it just takes one wrong turn in life and you end up on the streets without a home. It's very unfortunate. And of course the homelessness crisis is growing as the pandemic is worsening. It's true, it is growing. Uh, so to that end, you know, we are supporting a lot of urgent measures like Project Room Key, which is revitalizing underutilized hotels and motels, which as you can imagine, not a lot of people going to motels and hotels these days um, to turn into permanent supportive housing. And the answer to homelessness, and I will always maintain this, is housing, supportive housing. Supportive housing is great because it is housing with support of health, right? Whether it be physical health, mental health, job, that stuff is so important to make sure we have that. And definitely just being compassionate about that, try to understand you know, the struggles of, of folks um, who are living rough, living on the streets, very difficult times, especially during the winter and especially during the pandemic, very difficult. But we are doing what we can to provide the resources to make sure that we can have supportive housing and make sure we have the programs available to lift people out of this deep, deep, deep poverty. From Colin, oh, this is the next question. What advice do you have for a college freshman who wants to get involved in government? Um, so I've told this story a couple of times is I actually decided to do government and politics because I was applying for college when President Barack Obama was running for re-election. I was assigned between that and film studies and you know, ultimately I chose government, but you know, you're on the right track. If you're here and getting involved, asking questions, you're on the right track. And college, I think, is a great way to, or even in any schooling extracurricular activity, is a great, I think, sandbox to practice your skills. I uh, got my start as an elected official, uh, being a student senator and then a student body president at Davis. And you really learn the fundamentals of governing and working with other people and learning about politics. So definitely encourage you to do student government or other extracurricular, extracurricular activities. Um, and really practice about teamwork and working with other people. Because ultimately, what democratic government is, 
It's worth learning to work with people, putting your ego aside and knowing how to set goals together. Okay, let's see. From Kate, this is a good question too. How can we make sure corporations like Amazon, Google, Facebook, HP, Salesforce, Tesla, et cetera, are paying their fair share of taxes in California? How will this help California public services be funded? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. So there is a bill out right now. I'm not currently a co-author on it from Assemblymember Luz Rivas from Southern California of raising the corporate tax rate back to the 1980 level to fund programs and funding for homelessness and supportive housing. That is a huge measure that I hope to support. Um, and it's very, very important. And why caveat with saying we bring up corporate tax rates back to the 1980 levels is that they were drastically slashed, unlike, any other, any, uh, unlike many other states in the 1980s, and returning it modestly up by 2% is very fair, especially with these giant corporations that, Kate, you have uh, elaborated on, who make tons of money in our state, lots of money, even as lots of people are suffering. So it is a very fair proposal to to bring back the wealth to our state and invest it in communities in need. It's a very fair proposal. From Evan, my wife and I spend a large percentage of our income on rent. There, there just isn't enough rental housing in Fremont or any other city in the Bay Area for the matter. Very true. What legislation do you plan to introduce which will rapidly add affordable housing rentals so, the, so that supply meets demand and rents are affordable again? Excellent question, excellent question. So. Um, Going back to two of the bills that I talked about, we're going to do a vacancy tax to make sure that the houses that are that should be available are available to help that. And then secondly, uh, is social housing. Social housing will hopefully be a great mechanism to build housing at cost so that we aren't driving all our housing to just be luxury or market rate housing. As important as it is to have market rate housing, and I do believe it is important to have that, right? People who have high incomes need a place to live too. Everyone needs a place to live. We also need to focus on below market housing, which is affordable housing, in other words. So having social housing will be a key, key way to produce housing at costs and also put us, the people, the public in the driver's seat when it comes to housing production. Thank you for that question, good question. Um, from Renata, as your constituents, what can we do, what can we best do in your support, in your work, sorry, as your constituents, what can we do to support support your work in the district and Sacramento? Oh, very nice question. Well, thank you so much for asking that. Um, what you can do is definitely stay up to date with us. You can follow us on social media. Uh, if you're following us, if you're watching on Facebook right now, you can like our page. Follow us on social media. Uh, we're very active on that. I'm personally very active on social media and you'll get updates about what's going on in Sacramento. You can always subscribe to our newsletter, which is on the website. Um, staying up to date with us is very important because then you will know what kind of measures we're working for and expressing your support for it always helps. I cannot tell you how important it is for me to be able to say, and I, I think this is true, to be going back to my colleagues and say, this is what my constituents, this is what my community needs. And this is why I need your vote on it. You know, there are a lot of diverse communities and cities and districts all over California and we all have different needs, but universally, Right now, it's making sure we have a safe reopening of our economy, our schools, and making sure that it's affordable for everyone to stay. So important. All right. Um, from Les, your view on, oh. So, oh, so Les asks, your view on AB71, which is raising corporate tax rate, on businesses we have already lost. Oh, on uh, businesses. This is a different question, this sentence. We have already lost Oracle, Tesla, Hewlett Packard in the South Bay and could lose our property values because more people will leave other states. Now, just, just to, to clarify and have, have the truth about this is HP, Tesla, and Oracle aren't leaving. They aren't leaving. Uh, HP is consolidating their, their office work and their, their spaces, frankly, because of the COVID pandemic, right? A lot of people can work from home especially in these jobs, fortunately, and they are consolidating the office space and consolidating spaces. In fact, there's going to be a net job growth with HP. Tesla is not moving. Their factory is still going to be in Fremont because Tesla has enjoyed a very fruitful relationship with the state of California because of our major investments in electric vehicles, which we still will be doing in this budget uh, if the governor, you know, with the governor's proposal for electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. So very important. Um, what you have 
heard in the news though, is eccentric billionaires like Elon Musk or companies deciding to move their headquarters to Texas or other states. Now that does not mean that the jobs are leaving. That means they're just changing some things around. Now I do share your concern that this, you know, with the way things are going in California and the way the pandemic is going, what if we lose jobs, right? That is a very valid concern I share that with you. I have always expressed that it is one thing for corporations to decide to move their headquarters, but it's another thing for the workers, right? The highly mobile workers who can work from home who decide one day, well, living in California because it's so expensive, isn't worth it. They can have a similar cost of, li- or I'm sorry, this similar standard of living and a lower cost of living in other states. And that is why addressing the housing affordability crisis is so key because the moment we lose our talented, workforce that we've invested so much from our, from all the way from kindergarten to our UCs, to the bright, great communities, diverse communities that they live in. Once we lose those people, it's easy for a corporation to leave. And they don't even have to consider, oh, it's to uh, the tax codes or anything like that. They can just leave because the workforce also wants to leave. And that is, I'm afraid that is accelerating during the COVID pandemic with the wealth inequality that exists and also the work from home situation. Um, that could unfortunately accelerate. So. We have to be very thoughtful about these processes and making sure that we are allowing the workers, employees, the, the so many more choices and reasons to stay in California. Because ultimately businesses will want to be in California because the environment we create and the people we have. And that is why um, I, I genuinely believe, you know, people still will want to do business in California even after the pandemic. Uh, from Peggy, will you support a single payer healthcare system for California? I will. That's something I've talked about for a long time, and I do believe it is the best mode of delivery for health, universal healthcare. Um, there's definitely going to be more conversation about this and how you iron out the details, um, but we have quite literally proven that, even from a business standpoint, that employers having to provide healthcare for their employees is not the best system in a disaster where everyone loses their job and then they also lose their healthcare. And that ultimately just puts a strain back on taxpayer, right? Because then everyone has to go on Cal, um, Medi-Cal, I almost said Cal-Med, uh, Medi-Cal. So ultimately a string, but yes, I will support it. Uh, from Jason, most members of Congress only serve on two to three committees. I get state legislatures are much smaller in comparison, yes, but isn't, isn't serving on five committees taking time away from you devoting to other critical issues? How do you have the time and schedule to serve on all five of those committees? Um, I will say, how I have that is I'm an amazing multitasker um, and I have an amazing staff who are also on this call. Um, I can't, I don't do it alone, thankfully. I have full-time staff in the district and the capital who are ready to assist you if you have any issues. Um, but it is hard. I will, I will admit, Jason, it is very difficult. And the committees I'm on are very difficult. They are difficult. I did not sign up for an easy job and I'm not gonna shriek responsibility on it, but I can't think of any more important topics working on about budget, our urban, our urban spaces, education, and obviously our privacy and technology. Um, but I still will obviously be dedicating time to other folks' bills and other issues, um, even though I don't serve um, directly on the committee that oversees like EDD. That's still something of a quick concern to me. So I get to do that with the help of amazing staff who help me get through the day and also working very long hours. Um, it's actually not uncommon for me to be here in the office when it's dark, even though it gets dark early. Okay, uh, let's see. Please explain how committees work and how bills move quickly or slowly through committees. Um, it's a good question, um, though I don't know how to, to do it really quickly is, you know, if you went to school, if you went to school and you ever listened to the How a Bill Becomes a Law song, it's essentially that that process and that the committees are basically, if you think about the subgroups where the legislators get together and we talk about an issue at length, right? I will be lucky to be talking about education issues at length with other people who are really vested in this interest or they have expertise. And we'll be crafting those bills much, much more than say when it gets to a full floor, which is the full body for vote. And that's the uh, most succinctly I can put it. Um, how a bill moves quickly or slowly is, uh, I guess a short way to say if more people on the committee agree to it quickly uh, and if it's less controversial, I guess. Um, but you know, that's all based on having a lot of conversations, frankly. Uh, from Betsy, local public transportation has seen a big decline in ridership as people work from home and avoid enclosed spaces, as they should. What is a plan 
what is the plan at the state level to support public transportation until ridership recovers so we don't return to traffic congestion and emissions when things open? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. Um, so I am going to be watching very closely, especially being on transportation committee, to make sure there are long-term solutions to funding our transportation. Right now, as what Betsy is alluding to, is a lot of our public transportation is what we call fare box funded, fare box reliant. Essentially, is you know they're funded by the people going on the bus or going on the service and paying for tickets. Um, it's not a sustainable model, especially as we see with less and less people riding due to public health concerns. But we don't also want to limit the opportunities and uh, modes of transportation for people who rely on it, right? So that's why I'll be looking at long-term solutions to fund public transportation. Um, and you're right, public transportation is the number one way to reduce emissions and reduce traffic. So if you really care about solving traffic, unfortunately, it's not about adding lanes, it's about adding more bus lines and adding more track, uh, rail track. So that's gonna be really, really important. Okay. Uh, from Brenda, what do you think of people charging $100 for rapid COVID testing results? I don't think anyone should have to pay for a test. I really don't think anyone should have to pay for a test. Why are we allowing businesses to make profit over people, over people's urgencies? Fantastic question. Brenda, I genuinely am very disgusted at businesses or corporations that take advantage of people like this. Um, it sucks. You know, frankly, it really sucks. And I think there needs to be a lot more oversight on this which might be coming soon for maybe hopefully the federal level or even the state level. But yeah, we really can't be taking advantage of this. I believe testing should be rapid, it should be free. And if you look at even other countries, developed countries in the world, or even countries we don't even consider to compare the US at sometimes, they have had 24 hour rapid testing for free in other places in the world much sooner than we ever had. You know, even nowadays, we're still getting to only maybe uh, at best sometimes a day um, and it's, it's quite, in fact, a shame for our country. Okay, uh, Anthony, with rising numbers in, in COVID cases and the ICU swamped, should employees have their employees work from home if they are able to, and how is it enforced? Yes, they should. Frankly, they should have uh, people work from home if they are able to. How is it enforced? Um, if you refer and again, not a great, the perfect answer, but if you refer to the stay at home orders in your respective counties, either Alameda or Santa Clara counties, there are gonna be more details about how it's gonna be enforced and how it should be. Um, I will say a, a disappointment I've had is that because ultimately the state sets a lot of these standards and the counties ultimately have to follow, in Santa Clara County, when it came to retail, we were at 10% capacity and we we're at 10% capacity of retail of shoppers. And then the state went to 20% as a statewide. So we had to bump it up. So that is why it is so important for my role to hold the administration accountable and make sure they are following the best practices we have set locally. That's why it's so important. Yeah, so important. Uh, hi, Alex from Alexis. Missed the beginning of this, so my apologies. Oh, no worries, Alexis. Uh, Apologies if it was already covered, but I would love to hear about how you plan to support climate and environmental justice in the face of escalating air pollution, wildfires, wildfires, power outages, and diminishing green space, all of which hurt vulnerable people of color. The first and okay, lost it. the first and worst. Thanks for all your work. Also, thank you for submitting so many questions. It's some I, I struggle to read a little bit because it keeps going up. Uh, so I, I I thank you for that. Um, Fantastic question. Fighting climate change and environmental and fighting for environmental justice is a top priority of me, top priority of mine, and that's why I joined the Environmental Caucus. And you're right. You know, unfortunately, it is poor communities. Unfortunately, there's more communities of color that often are the forefront of climate disasters, whether it be wildfires or whether it be air pollution. And we are definitely going to be looking at that. You know, there are definitely going to be efforts to make sure we hold polluters accountable, to make sure there are the right measures to to basically make amends to those communities and to make sure that we are powering our communities responsibly. So, oh my God, there's a lot of questions on that. Uh, so it is very, very important that we are fighting against climate change. And one thing that, you know, I am a huge supporter of, a, of the Green New Deal and, and a California Green New Deal, which hopefully will come soon. Um, but my priority when it comes to California Green New Deal is gonna be about our built environments, which, 
you know, if you think about the Green New Deal or climate change, often you think about solar panels or windmills or environmental protection and green spaces like parks, uh, which is super important, very, very important. But oftentimes what gets left out is the built environment, what we choose consciously to do with the land we have, right? How do we build on it? How do we get people to and from spaces? That's transportation and housing. And that's why it's so important for me to be focusing on those issues because if we reduce um, car trips, it's gonna really reduce air pollution and, re and reduce our effects on, um, on climate change. And if we make our buildings more efficient, that will also reduce our climate, uh, our carbon footprint. That was a lot of good questions. I appreciate the newsroom section on your website. Thank you. Can you also include a link to the actual legislation in your posts? Uh, in my posts? Example, Clean Money Act posts. Uh, yes, uh, we can. I will definitely flag that with my staff to include it in our posts. Um, Shirley. This is person named Shirley. Shirley, when we think of financial stability and young people, we usually think they are just dependents on their parents. But young adults are at a critical transition point in their lives, trying to launch from youth to adulthood and independence. I know that. Many are not in school or have been laid off restaurant and retail industries due to COVID, yes? Uh, Shirley's question is, what are your thoughts on how to support our most economically vulnerable young adults of color in our communities? Fantastic question, fantastic question. Um, frankly, at this point in time, it's getting direct, direct material relief to working class families, young or old, making sure we get the direct cash. So that is why I co-signed uh, co a letter to get $5 billion in direct relief to, to, to folks. Right now, the governor is proposing $600 to, to people in need in mirroring what Congress is gonna give us. And keep in mind, even a grand total of the 600 from, from the state, 600 from Congress this time, and the uh, 1,200 from the federal government last year, that's only $2,400. And I cannot, for the life of me, imagine anyone surviving a whole year in the Bay Area on $2,400. So direct material relief is gonna be so important. Uh, I'm a big supporter of, uh, if you've ever heard of the concept of UBI, universal basic income, and making sure folks have uh, direct aid is important. But of course, um, let's harp on this all the time, but housing affordability is really important. The biggest, I think it was, I forgot what the statistic is right now off the top of my head, but it was like, I, th I think a third of Californians spend more than 50% of their income just on housing on the basic necessity of having a roof over their head. And if we can um, mitigate the economic uncertainty, a lot of young people, and frankly, a lot of older folks will have much better prospect for economic, um, economic future. Okay, let's see. So we're getting near the end. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to, to put them on. I really do appreciate all these questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna get through all of them because I literally, I'm seeing hundreds of questions, uh, but we will hopefully try to get back to you if you have a really pressing question. Um, Nicholas, I appreciate your, I, or sorry, I admire your willingness to start working on legislation from day one. Thank you. And would like to support your work, but I do not live in your district. Oh, what opportunity are, what opportunities are available for non-constituents who want to support your efforts? Well, thank you so much, Nicholas, for, for your support in that. Um, you know, basic courtesy is write to your state assembly member, write to your state senator, let them know how you feel. They want to hear from you. And if you think my ideas are good ideas, you should let them know. Um, but we always welcome your advocacy and any support you can provide uh, as we move forward on our on our campaigns, on our bills. So thank you so much, Nicholas, for, for offering that. Uh, Paul, this question is from Paul. Other forms of business, businesses are so important for the economic vitality of our society. What do you think about collective worker-owned enterprises? Will you introduce and or strengthen legislation to, to co-op, cooperative businesses, public banking, public community land trusts, and so forth. Um, yes, but before I answer this question, could we pull up our last slide? Because I do, I just look at the time and we are running near the end. So unfortunately this will have to be my last uh, answer. But uh, Paul, to your point, yes, to your point, yes. There will be these efforts. I don't wanna steal the thunder from other authors just out of respect to them, but there will be efforts like this and I will be a strong supporter and working with them uh, collectively on these issues. But I definitely think, um, especially, um, it's especially important 
you know, I think just, just taking a step back from this question, it's especially important that your work is value in your workplace, that you see the fruits of your labor and worker owned co co worker owned cooperatives. And there's a lot of examples actually in this country of them, um, most famously from a cranberry juice meme, um, is a worker cooperative as well. Um, it's so important to have workers owning that because one, you build more investment from people who work in it. And you also share risk and you share the rewards more evenly. And I think that also makes us more and more durable because back to someone else's question early on, what do we do about big high-tech companies just leaving us, right? We do not, the Silicon Valley, we do not want to be a Detroit, right? No, no offense to Detroit, but we don't want to be a situation in which we are so dependent on one industry. And once they leave, that leaves us a shell of our former selves. We don't want to be that way. We definitely do not want to be that way. And I think having more diversity not just in the people who live here, but also the businesses and the type of commerce that we have is going to be so important. And I think worker co-ops is going to be a strong, um, strong component of that, and especially public land trust and public banking. Public banking is a big one. It will come. You watch. Um, but it'll be important. And I'm going to have a meeting about public co sorry, uh, worker co-ops soon enough, actually. So great questions. Um, OK, well, I. We're gonna wrap it up here for questions, unfortunately. I know there was a lot, a lot of questions on the call here and I really, really do um, appreciate all the questions. Um, if you do want to follow up on a question, feel free to leave some sort of contact info for it. I'm so sorry we couldn't reach everyone. Uh, we're gonna have more events in the future. We're gonna have like a office hour, virtual office hours and everything. Um, but I do wanna again remind you that if you have issues uh, with EDD or say DMV or state agency, please contact us at the contact info you're seeing here. You can call us at 408-262-2501, or you can email me. You can email me your concern too if you feel more comfortable doing it that way. Um, you can always call or, or email. Uh, if you have any concerns or have any opinions even, you can always reach out to us. I always maintain kind of a, I guess, a virtual open door policy. So you can feel free to, um, to reach out at any point. So uh, feel, please do that. Uh, again, really, really appreciate everyone's participation. Very lively chat that was happening. And yeah, feel free to please screen. Um, yeah, but please feel free to reach out to us anytime. All right. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe out there. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you, everyone.